We are in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19, just a few verses here toward the end of this book. Chapter 21, verse 15, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, fourth gospel account, one gospel, his name is Jesus. Hear the word of the Lord, John 21, 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, that's Jesus. He said to Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Verse 19. This he said, Jesus said, to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word uh, this morning. Keep your, keep your Bibles open to John 21 as the children are dismissed for children's church. May you go in blessing of God. Thank you for all the teachers that serve this beautiful, wonderful ministry to our children. As you know, there's an opening. We need help. If you want to keep the program going, we need, we need some volunteers, so consider that, please. We'll train you, whatever it needs, whatever you need. John chapter 21. Next week, I can't believe it, sermon number 72, this week 71, uh, is the last time we'll be in this book as an, exp- you know, you can read it anytime you want, all right? Um, uh, of the sinless life, this is grace-filled ministry, atoning death, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I'm anticipating next week, if you find me in my office grieving over this book as it closes, I had gone through something similar to that when, I went through, when we went through the gospel according to Mark. It's something special about walking with Jesus for 72 sermons, a year and a half. Um, so it'll, it'll, it'll be a, a, a special day for me. Um, and I, hopefully I, I'm praying that this has been a beneficial study for you too, that through this gospel account, walking with Jesus, that he is producing in you a greater love and a greater devotion and worship of him. And as we come to this last chapter, although it's one just beautiful and magnificent scene, we are going to look at chapter 21 in three separate segments. I tried to push it out for another four months, but I don't think it's going to work, but... Um, so last week, Pastor in Process, Chris Cajano, did a great job. He looked at the first 14 verses of this epilogue. As we said last week, that an epilogue is not just simply a conclusion to a book, but an epilogue really is a tying together of loose ends. Uh, sometimes a, a, a climatic conclusion can come before the epilogue as it ties up loose ends. And, and that's what we actually saw. We actually saw and witnessed a climatic statement at the end of chapter 20. And at the end of chapter 20, verse 28, and 1 John, uh, excuse me, John chapter 1, two bookends, beginning of the book, concluding of the book, we see the exclamation of Thomas in chapter 20, verse 28. John opens up, John 1, the prologue, the eternal word who became flesh and dwelt among us, his name is Jesus. And then in John 20, 28, Thomas uh, shouts and then proclaims, my Lord and my God. And, and, And the answer, or excuse me, the question that has been on the forefront of John's mind as he writes this gospel narrative, is who is Jesus? That's what the book is all about. Who is Jesus? And by recognizing him, not the Jesus of your own mind that you made up, but the Jesus, the the historical reality of the Jesus of Scripture, as he reveals himself to us, and as we worship him and love him and trust him, we will have life in his name. John opens the prologue with the eternality of the word. He's the Messiah, he's the Christ, he's the Son of God. Of God means of the same nature. 
He has come just as God had promised. And Jesus has been revealing to us throughout this book, throughout this gospel account, uh, who he is by obeying the Father, by revealing his Father perfectly, both in word, his teaching, and in deed, in his doing, in his miracles. And of course, culminating in his death, burial, and resurrection. It was Thomas at the end who saw the risen Christ. Chapter 20, verse 28, book ending with John 1. 1 through 14, my Lord and my God. We have this young man who grew up in a Hebrew home who understand the Shema, that Lord our God is one, and now sees the risen Christ, and the only thing he can do is address him with language of adoration, worship, majesty, and beauty. I mean, it's really that simple. The one who had died is now alive. Men do not die and rise with a glorified body as Jesus did, and he proclaims my Lord and my God. It is, it is both propositional, Jesus is Lord and God. It is also personal, my Lord and my God. The deity of Christ, make this clear, the deity of Christ, the second person of the one triune God, is absolutely essential, foundational, and indispensable for our salvation. There is no other way that you and I can be reconciled to God. To have a relationship with him unless we come to that heartfelt, soul-resting reality. Jesus Christ is Lord. God himself comes in the flesh, dies on the cross for our sins, and rises from the dead. In fact, when Thomas, in chapter 20, verse 28, said, my Lord and my God, two verses later, John says, this is what the book is all about. John 20 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, not written in this book, but these things were written so that you may believe, trust, yield to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. John 20, verse 30. Conclusion. But there's one last thing John wants to address, and that's why we have an epilogue, chapter 21. And the epilogue actually has a name. The epilogue's name is Peter. <laughs> Although he's not the hero of the story, Jesus is the hero of every story. Whether it's David and Goliath, whatever story you read in Scripture, Jesus, our God, is the story, is the hero of every story. But Peter is the recipient of God's grace and highlighted here in this passage to show forth the grace and the love and the mercy of God. Chapter 21, the epilogue, as I said, is in three segments. Last week, Jesus was reminding Peter and the others of the call. Chapter 21, verses 1 through 14, which was done last week, was reminiscent of Luke 5 when Jesus first called the disciples after catching no fish one evening and then providing fish for them to become fishers of men. And, and Jesus is bringing them, Peter and the rest to that place, reminding them of the call. To be, or to be called as fishers of men is to join Jesus on his mission, demonstrating and declaring the gospel, the good news. God is calling everyone everywhere to repent, to turn from sin, and to trust and believe in God who is the gospel. Last week, Jesus reminding Peter of the call. This week, he's restoring Peter in love. Let me say that again. He's reminding Peter of the call last week. This week, he's restoring Peter in love. Three simple headings. Well, it's not simple, actually. It's a little complicated. Uh, I was just going to go with past, present, and future, real short, but we went with this because I want you to see that Jesus is, he's, he's preparing this scene for a purpose of restoring Peter. So he's preparing this scene and this narrative to take Peter back to his, his past association, his, his denial. Two, he asks some questions, three questions, right? Seem the, the same three questions to, to, to bring Peter to this present restoration, to be restore Peter. And finally, the explanation. Jesus tells Peter of his future glorification, how he was going to actually glorify God. Past association, present restoration, future glorification, number one. Turn with me one page, two pages back to the gospel according to John, verse, chapter 18, chapter 18, verse 15. If you remember, Jesus was betrayed by Judas he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was taken to Annas, the patriarch, 
of the high priestly family. He was the elder, older high priest. If you also remember, Caiaphas was actually the high priest that year, but once you become a high priest, you are for life. But Caiaphas, the younger, I think it was the son-in-law of Annas. Uh, and both these men, if you remember, lived in the same courtyard where the priests lived together. The high priest lived in the same courtyard. And uh, both Annas, the patriarch, and Caiaphas lived in the same courtyard. Now, verse 15 of chapter 18 it says this, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple, that's John who's writing this, since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. Imagine courtyard, okay? Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, John, known to the high priest, went out and said to the servant girl that was out there, who kept watch, and said, you know, Peter's with me, verse 17, the servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Peter's going into this courtyard now. Verse 18, it says something very uh, interesting. Chapter 18, verse 18. Now the servants of the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. And they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also with them, standing and warming himself. After Annas questioned Jesus, verse 24 of chapter 18, he sent Jesus bound to Caiaphas, the high priest that year, in the same courtyard, bound to the other, maybe, 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 you know, very close, I don't know exactly where it was, but in that same courtyard, now it's Caiaphas' turn to question him. Now look at verse 25 of chapter 18, it says this, again, now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so that's the third time that we see that actually, so they said to him, you are also one of his disciples, are you? You are, not one of, you are also not one of his disciples. He denied it, and he said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, remember him, Malchus, uh, said, did I not see you in the garden with him? You're the guy with the sword, right? <laughs> Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. In this same scene, narrative, in Luke chapter 22 verse 55 it says that there was a fire kindled in the middle of the courtyard and then in Luke goes on in verse 60 says this about Peter's denial Peter said I do not know what you're talking about They're like you know this guy you're one of his disciples I don't know what you're talking about Luke twenty two sixty. 60 and immediately while he was speaking the rooster crowed and the Lord turned and looked at Peter so Peter's warming himself, denies him, third time looks, and it looks right at the eyes of Jesus. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. There are only two places in the New Testament, only two places in the New Testament, where the word charcoal is mentioned. And guess where they are? Right here, in the courtyard, in the scene of denial, of the denial, is dissociation with Christ, and in chapter 21, verse 9, in the epilogue. Verse 9, when they got out, when they, the disciples, got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. Last week we learned that the sovereign Lord told the fish in the evening not to go into the nets of, of this lifelong fisherman that are out there fishing, and then the next morning he commands the fish to go into the nets, and it was then that John recognized that it was Jesus. Peter jumps out of the boat and runs, beelines it to the shore, and, and when he gets to the shore... Jesus just happens to be there with a charcoal fire burning. The risen Christ is waiting on the shore with a fire, a charcoal fire. The scene is blaring. This was not simply Jesus cooking for his disciples, although it was, serving them. But he is preparing Peter to deal with his denial. That same denial that took place around a charcoal fire. Jesus then comes to Peter in the epilogue of John and asks him three times, not twice, not once, not four, not five, not six, three times, Peter, do you love me? 
Again, showing and reminding Peter that although he failed miserably three times, Jesus is now going to restore him by asking him three times. That the, the, the three time, the threefold assertion of his love for Jesus reflects and counterbalances his threefold denial of Jesus in the courtyard at the charcoal fire. Chapter 21, verse 15. They finished breakfast. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said, Lord, you know that I love you. Verse 16. He asked him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Lord, you, you know that I love you. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Do, do, do you see something else reminiscent here? Do you see something else going on from the past? If you've been tracking with us, John chapter 1, verse 21, Andrew, Peter's brother, finds the Messiah, goes and gets his brother, Simon, brings Simon to Jesus, chapter 1, verse 21. Jesus walks up to him and says, you're Simon, son of John. You now shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, stone, rock-like. Isn't it interesting that although Jesus changed Peter's name from Simon to Peter Stone, he calls him Simon right here? Why? Because Peter wasn't there yet. <laughs> Peter wasn't there yet. The name change hasn't really taken place yet. At this point, the name change demonstrated who Peter was becoming. When the power of God, the life-changing power of Jesus comes into his life. But it hasn't happened. The power will turn Peter from this wishy-washy disciple into a solid and courageous person. But for now, while Jesus is dealing with Peter's failures and denial and dissociation, Jesus goes back to his old name because Peter is acting like the old self. It's a chilling reminder. That his behavior had not been like the kind of person who stands strong and affirms his love for Jesus. But it will. It will. Do you see what's going on? Do you see Jesus highlighting his grace, highlighting his love by calling Peter by his original name, Simon, son of John. It reminded Peter of who he had been when he first met Jesus so that now Peter can be humbled. And ready to be all that God was going to make him to be. Family, I know there are some preachers out there that only want to talk positive to you. But do not let, do not be disheartened. Do not throw in the towel. Do not walk away. Do not be disintegrated. When circumstances remind you of your past failures, we don't want to stay there. But God can and will use those reminders to humble ourselves so that we, like Peter, will not be dependent on self, be, be self-confident, boast about things that could never stand the test of time. Peter is like us in so many ways. So many people over the centuries have, have connected with Peter. His failures are familiar with those own failures in our, over li in our own lives. He, he overrates himself and underrates his temptation. He thinks he's more devoted than he really is. <laughs> he thinks he loves Jesus more than he really does. He thinks he can face difficulties and trials and hardships by his own strength and overcome obstacles and then finds out, I can't do this on my own. You might say, wow, Jesus, wow. You, you set up a charcoal fire, reminiscent of his denial. You ask him three times, because he denied you three times. And then you call him Simon. You're cutting it kind of deep, don't you think? Yeah. But the knife in which Jesus is cutting Peter is not a murderer's knife trying to cut his throat. It is a surgeon's knife in love and mercy, cutting out that part of Peter that Jesus knows needs to go. It hurts. Been there, done that. And by love, God continues as a good surgeon to love us in that way. 
loving surgeon cutting out the disease of our souls. Sometimes it's a reminder. We can't do it on our own. We need his help. We need his strength. We need his power. We've got to be careful about self-confidence. Past failures. Look at the question. Verse 15. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, then tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And then Peter said to him, Lord, you know everything. He's sovereign. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So the first observation we need to make in this text, and I don't think it's the most important one, but it is one we have to talk about, is who and what is Jesus talking about when he says, do you love me more than these? Neuter, it is, it is, it, it is not defined. What does Jesus mean when he says, do you love me more than these? There's three possibilities. One, do you love me, Peter, more than these, meaning more than these disciples, as Jesus turns to the rest of the men. Do you love me, Peter, more than you love them? Kind of reminiscent of Jesus' strong and hyperbolic words in Luke 14. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. It doesn't mean it literally, it's hyperbole. It is, it is that the supreme love of God over everything in this universe. Do you love me, Peter, more than these? Do you love me more than you love them? Or two, do you love me more than this fishing gear? As Peter is back to fishing, and, and, and Jesus wants to bring Peter to that place and say, do you love me more than the old life? Will you, will you now follow me? Are you, are you ready to put down that life and come to me? Again, Luke 5, Peter, uh, excuse me, Jesus says to Peter, do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. Do you, do you love me more than this old life? Or three, which I think I, I land on the third one. Do you love me more than... These meaning, do you love me more than these disciples love me? I think on one level they're all probably somewhat accurate, but there is a, they knew what Jesus was meaning. In other words, Jesus is saying, do you love me, Peter, more than they love me? Do you love me more than they love me? If you remember... Peter's failure really began from his boasting that his love and devotion was greater than anyone else. I love you more than anyone. On the night Jesus was betrayed while others were growing quiet, Peter insisted, chapter 13, verse 37, I will lay down my life for you, not we will lay down our lives for you. Dr. Carson, New Testament scholar, writes this, Peter obviously had had a high opinion of his loyalty and probably had regarded himself as the model of love and respect for Jesus. But he had hardly lived up to his own view of his loyalty or in comparison to others. So Jesus confronted Peter's own high opinion of himself and in so doing made Peter face his own frailty head on. You could talk about the three different possibilities in your community groups this week. But listen to this. This is Peter's denial. This is written, an uh, eyewitness account written in Matthew. Same scene, same thing going on. Peter is denying the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's the night before he was cru uh, to be crucified. And this is what Matthew writes. Jesus said to them, Matthew 26, You, plural, y'all, will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd... That's Jesus be going to the cross, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Go to Galilee. Peter answered this statement of Jesus. Now, put yourself in that room. It's Jesus telling him, you're going to be scattered. You're going to fall away. I'm going to be crucified. All of you are going to fall away. And this is what Peter writes. Though they all may fall away. Although they may all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Can you imagine being there going, dude, I can speak for myself. Oh, then they will all fall, but I won't. 
Peter was claiming a high level of devotion more than anyone. And Jesus is saying, look, you need to reevaluate your statements. You need to reevaluate your boastful claim. And Peter had to do it three times. Second thing I want to point out in this passage, if you have any kind of study Bible, if you have any kind of notes, something's going to be said about the word love. In this passage, in John 20 and 15 and following, the word love is used multiple times. The NIV tries to show the difference in the Greek word of love. Now, the word love, if you don't know this, many of you probably do. Let me just hit it quick. The word love in the Greek, in the original language of the New Testament, there are four different words for love. Two of them in the New Testament, two of them in the ancient Greek. You could, you could look it up. Two, four of them. Two in the Bible, one is agapeo, which means sacrificial love. It is, a, it is a I love you no matter what love, love of purpose, the highest sacrificing, sacrificial love. Men, love your wife as Christ loved the church. It's, it's, it's a sacrificial love, agapeo. The second one is phileo, where we get our word Philadelphia, a city of brotherly love. It's a mutual love. It's, a, it's I love you, you love me, we do nice things for each other. Nothing wrong with that. It involves emotion, affection, friendship, love. Um, usually between two equals. The third word for love not found in the New Testament is called eros, where we get our word erotic, not found again in the New Testament. It has to do with physical senses. Again, nothing wrong with that within the confines of marriage. The fourth word is called storge, which has to do with parental love for children. In this text, Jesus and Peter are going back and forth, and the word love, phileo and agape is intertwined. And now, I'm going somewhere with this, but let me just tell you what it says so you understand. Verse 15, it says this. Jesus said, in the original language, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you agapeo me? Do you, do you love me sacrificially more than these? Peter said to him, Lord, you know that I phileo you. The mutual love. Jesus said, then feed my lambs. Verse 16. He said to him a second time, Simon, do you love me? Agapeo, do you love me? Sacrificially love me. Second time. Peter says, Lord, you know that I phileo, brotherly love you. Then he says, tend my sheep. Verse 17, Jesus, again, the third time, Simon, instead of saying, do you agapeo me? He says, do you phileo me? He used the same word. Peter's grieved because he said to him the third time, do you phileo me? Lord, you know everything. You know that I phileo you. So there's no, no agape in, in that verse 17. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. So here's the question. Is Peter grieved because simply because Jesus asked him three times in connection with his denial? Or is Peter grieved because he asked him three times and changed the verb from phileo to, uh, from agape to phileo? That's the question. Is there much to be said about those two words, changing of those verbs? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> the problem, the problem with making much of these Greek verb changes is this. In the gospel according to John, John uses the verb, the two verbs for love, phileo and agape, interchangeably. Every commentator should point that out. So in John chapter 3, it says that the Father agapeo Jesus. He loves Jesus in John 3. In John 5, it says the Father phileo Jesus. Does that mean he loves him less that day? Absolutely not. And John used the same thing with, with Lazarus, that he loves Lazarus. He uses both verbs. So you, you see this interchangeable uh, wording of, of, of this Greek verb love in John. So people say, you know, we shouldn't make much of it because John uses it interchangeably. And, but here's what we know. Peter is experiencing humility for his self-assertiveness because Jesus asked him the third time. Three times about his love. And Peter cannot come to that place and go, yes, I do love you more than these. He just says, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. And the bottom line is this, family. Listen. Do you love Christ more than, fill in the blank. Do you love Christ more than, fill in the blank. Are you real about your love? Are you real about where you're at? Following Christ is a love relationship. And Jesus knows how much you love him, I love him not. The third time Jesus asked, regardless of the verb change, I am sure, brought the point home. Can you imagine the scene? 
charcoal fire, three questions, Peter's relationship with Jesus. He's, he's bringing, you know, a, a piece of humble pie to Peter. Was Peter ready to love Jesus as he was and not as he wished him to be? Is he, is he dealing with truth? Peter, I think, in this restoration, Peter now is humble, truthful, and honest, and affirms, I do love you, Lord. But he would not go far to say, I love you more. Truth, honesty, and humility. You know, Psalm 51, 17 says this. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. Verse 17, you know everything, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. We can't hide that from Christ. We can't hide the love we have for Christ from him. Peter needed to understand that his love for the Savior was not as great as he thought it was. In fact, his fishing wasn't as great as he thought it was either. He couldn't catch any fish. <laughs> but bottom line is, Peter, look to me. The preeminent love in your life needs to be me. And Peter needs to recognize the highest and preeminent love is Christ. And Jesus is restoring this man in love. One commentator wrote this, love is the power of of obedience. Love is the power of duty. Love is the power of service. Love is the power of sacrifice. Love is the power of worship. Love is the power of fellowship. Love is everything. So you see this in the opening verses and the Lord's dialogue with the Apostle Peter. Here is a man, he writes, who needs a total restoration, end quote. But notice, notice the text, how love and restoration are proved by our actions. Jesus will ask Peter the question three times, do you love me? Three times Peter affirms his love, but three times Jesus will call him to serve others. See that? Why? Because you will follow, serve, and sacrifice for what you love. You will follow, serve, and sacrifice for what and who you love. And loving Jesus is demonstrating in the caring for God's people. It's proof of the preeminence of love of your life. John the same author wrote in his first epistle, if you see, if you have the world's goods, if you have things that you could use to hurt, uh, to, to heal and to help others and see your brother in need, yet you close your heart, how could God's love be in you? See, when you love someone, you care about the things they care about. Suppose a man in the military, in a Marine, who was loved deeply by his wife was deployed to Afghanistan. Let's say it was an emergency, and he takes off in, in the middle of the night. It's summertime. And when he leaves, he left behind a beautiful Harley Davidson in the driveway. It's in the Northeast. It's summer. He's getting ready to ride. But he's gone a year. Do you think she would just let us sit there through the inclement weather and harsh winters? No. She loved him. She would care for it, wash it, and keep it in pristine condition until he returned. Why? Because it is an expression of her love for her husband in her husband's absence. Absence. Now, I know it's not Father's Day, guys, but you got that one. Right? So she would love him by serving, by, by caring for the things he cared. When we care about the Lord and we love the Lord, it is seen by the care of his people. Do you love me, Peter? Feed, Bosco, feed my lambs. Do you love me, Peter? Tend, where we get our word shepherd, po poemo. Tend my sheep. Again, feed my sheep. Je Jesus is simply telling Peter, listen, Peter, do you really love me? Then, then take care of my sheep. If you love me, you'll have the passions I am passionate about, the love that I have for my people. If you love me, you will be a good shepherd. Shepherds what? Tend sheep. Feed sheep. Care for sheep. Watch over sheep and care for the weakest and the most vulnerable sheep of the flock. Love must be sacrificial, humble service. And what you have here is this affirmation, and this is important. Jesus is restoring Peter to the place of trust in the midst of failure. So Peter, I, I want you to see the charcoal fire. I want you to see your, your name as I call you by your old name, I, I want you to see that you denied me three times, but I want to affirm you every time you say, I love you, Lord. Feed, tend, care. I'm trusting you, Peter. Even though you have failed, I am trusting you now to tend and care for my 
sheep. It's like every time Jesus says, I want you to see your failure, I want, to just, I want you to see your brokenness, is when Peter opens up his heart and then Jesus drives home and digs home this affirmation, this trust, this love. Feed, care, tend my sheep, Peter. Now, I, I get that this is a restoration of an apostolic authority. I get that Peter will be an apostle and a pastoral leadership, but this is for us this morning as well. It has more to do with love and the expression of love than it is just bringing Peter back to his apostolic authority. Calvin was right. He said, no, one, no man will steadily preserve in the discharge of his ministry unless the love of Christ shall reign in his heart. And, and notice the order. His failures, Jesus brings him to that place of failure, and then Jesus restores him, loves him, recognizing, Peter recognizing that, you know, apart from Christ we could do nothing. He's lovingly restored him, and then he says, serve me. Serve me. Now, let me speak directly to some of you this morning. For many reasons, multiple reasons, maybe you have failed and you have, you have fallen, like Peter. This is not just for Peter's benefit. This is not simply for those who shepherd God's people, although it is. Dr. Keller wrote this. Now, listen to this carefully. Dr. Keller, Tim Keller, pastor in New York City. He says, do you know what Jesus is saying? Plunge your failure into my grace and I'll make you greater than you were before. A greater failure plunged into my grace makes you a greater leader, a greater shepherd, end quote. Jesus comes to Peter this, in love, in mercy, in tenderness, restores him, and trust the sheep and the flock to him. And he's coming to us this morning too in our failures, our denials of him, in how we lived. And he is saying, plunge your failure into my grace. Plunge it into my love. Plunge it into my forgiveness. Love me. Not for the reason to be forgiven. Not for the reason to be loved. But because we are loved in the gospel. Like Peter, come to Jesus and you will receive not judgment but, and rejection, but forgiveness and grace. You know, as I was studying this passage, I was wondering, when, did, when could we really see this restoration of Peter begin? Now, if you've been reading along with us, you'll know that uh, Peter, at some point during Jesus' post-resurrection, before this account, Peter had some contact with Jesus. We don't know. We just know they made contact. We don't know what was said. This is the first account that we have a full account of, of Peter and Jesus. And I'm wondering, you know, when, when do we see this restoration begin? You know what? You know what I think? I think it begins, I think Peter's restoration begins when he sees the Lord and jumps out of the boat and runs to Jesus. Notice the difference in that narrative compared to Judas. Sinful Peter, sinful Judas. Judas runs away from Jesus and hung himself while Peter runs to Jesus. He's forgiven and restored. And the difference has to do with genuine God-centered repentance. 2 Corinthians 7.10, for godly grief, godly repentance, godly brokenness produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. Godly sorrow, God-centered repentance, turning from sin, is a turning to God, to Christ. It, it, it realizes the emptiness of asserting our own strength, relying on our own power, and coming to the place of resting in God's power, in God's grace. Peter realized it. Judas ended his life over it. Past association, present restoration, and finally the explanation. Look. Verse 18, truly, truly, I solemnly tell you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Verse 19, this he said, Jesus said, to show him, that's Peter, what kind of death he was to glorify God. <laughs> and after saying this, he said to me, to him, follow, follow me. D do you see? Jesus is not simply restoring Peter, bringing him back to the past, restoring him in the present. Jesus is, is, is engaging Peter, loving Peter, restoring Peter, because what lies ahead for Peter? 
You see, he's making it clear that what his, what his final and closing reasons for asking the questions in the first place. Not, not to put Peter on the spot. Not simply even or only to, to make a spectacle or anything of him or to, to bring him restoration. He wanted to show Peter what lies in the future. And Peter's going to need restoration and able to go forward in his life. By grace and intimacy, Peter's going to face martyrdom. Jesus tells him, in fact, in the ancient world, that term, stretch out your hands, is used when someone is carrying his cross up. They, they crucified people regularly, right, in those days. Someone would carry his cross up to the hill to be crucified, and they would stretch out his hands and nail the condemned man. It's reminiscent of John 13. When Peter said to, to the Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I'm going, you can't follow me now, but you will follow me, Peter. By the time this gospel account was written in the 80s, 90s, 80s, um, this happened already. Church tradition tells us, and we have a historical record of Peter being crucified at the end of Nero's term, which is 64, 66 AD. Peter brought to Rome and then crucified. We have strong record of that. It's not, some people say he was crucified upside down. We don't have that much. I don't know how certainly that is, but Peter was definitely crucified, and he followed the footsteps of his Lord. So this is not simply a martyrdom. This is, you will follow me. In the future, you will be crucified. That's the kind of death you will suffer. Now think for a minute, family. Think. Peter is being told by this, by Jesus. Peter's told, Jesus is telling Peter this. 30 years later, that happened. Can you imagine Jesus, who knows everything, and says, you will be crucified. That's how you're going to die have a good day. I'll see you in 30 years. Oh, my word. I'm like, I'm, I'm hiding in the hills. That's where no one's ever going to find me. I'm going to die in old age somehow. You know, that's what I would do. It didn't discourage Peter. It reminded Peter that the sovereign Lord is standing before him. Nothing can happen to him. Nothing can happen to us that we cannot glorify God in it, even death. What could man do? Whatever circumstances come our way, all of them are submitted to the sovereignty of God. Whether it's a lifelong life like John or God glorifying martyrdom like Peter. Jesus knew Peter would suffer martyrdom. And just like Peter said, Lord, you know all things, and he does. Church history, church and history are in the sovereign hands of God. Now, Peter in his, in his first epistle will write this. He says to it, to, this is later on. He says, 1 Peter, 1 Peter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed, his incalculable worth, his majesty is revealed, even in death. If you, he writes, are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Even toward the end of Peter's life, in 2 Peter, Peter knows he is ready to die. That Nero and the Rome, he is going to be martyred. And this is what he writes. Listen to 2 Peter. He says, same guy, I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. He told me so. What kind of death he was to glorify God. Just linger on that for a second. What kind of death will you die that will glorify God? You see, Peter's crucifixion did not end in disaster. Peter's crucifixion did not end in tragedy, but glory. The death of Lazarus did not end in tragedy, but glory. Jesus' own death did not end in tragedy, but glory. Yes, a different glory than man, but glory nonetheless. The statement here seems to show us that all of us must consider how our appointed death will bring glory to God. The Apostle Paul himself talked about that in Philippians. He said, it is my eager expectation and hope. I will not be put ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is what? Gain. 
we're talking about glorifying God in death. Like, that's not why I came to church this morning. I don't know what to tell you. It's right here. I had to think about it all week. <laughs> one historian describes how one believer was condemned and many others would rush forward and declare themselves as Christians so they too can be condemned along with their brothers and sisters. They received death sentences with joy and laughter. Now, I'm not saying we should seek torture and death as a better way to die like radical Islam tying bombs to your body. That's not what I'm saying. Okay? God's will for Peter was martyrdom. God's will for John was live a long life and die a natural death. We will all die unless Jesus returns. Are we determining in advance on how we will bring him glory in death? That's what he's talking about. Wesley used to say of the Methodists, our people die well. John Calvin's close friend, while John Calvin was on a, a painful death, on his painful deathbed, his friend Theodore Beza wrote this about John Calvin. We can truly say that in this one man, God has been pleased to demonstrate to us in our day the way to live well and to die well, end quote. So what does it mean to bring glory to God in death? That's that. To give glory to God in death. Let me just give you three quick things you guys can talk about in community groups. Number one, how do we bring glory to God in death? Number one, it does not mean we deny the reality and the pain of death. This is not a refusal or denial of pain. Pain is pain, not pleasure. It doesn't mean that one ignores the inner reality and struggle in which we all will face when we face death squarely. It means that we come to the place where God is enough. We come to the place where we are satisfied and content in God. We come to the place where we rest in his mercy. We understand his love. We cling to the cross. Number two, Peter came to this realization that he will die and give God glory because the God of glory is standing right before him, raised from the dead, empty tomb. The same one who says you will glorify me in death has already conquered death. And therefore, Jesus has the authority and the power to reign and rule all of life, death, the universe. He's standing before Peter. And Peter has the assurance, the risen Christ, that he will meet him on the other side. That he will raise him too because Jesus Christ has been raised. Number three, look at Jesus. Look at his arms stretched out for you. Look at his cross for you. That he died for you. That he is the ultimate shepherd, the ultimate friend who gave himself for those who rejected him. Scorned him. That's us. And yet he died anyway. He voluntarily stretched out his arms on the cross, paid for our sins. He loves us and now we are accepted in him. That fills up that infinite depth of love needed in our hearts. That will enable you to glorify him in life. And in death. In other words, Jesus is saying, listen, as, as, I, as I had my hands and arms open for you, to the degree you understand that, to the degree that you grasp that, to the degree that that has changed your life, you will be able to see that in all of life, that in, even in death, you are loved, you are secured, you are accepted in me. I paid the penalty for your sins. I've conquered sin, death, and hell. Peter, you will die, and you will bring me glory because I will be enough. And then he tells Peter two, two words here. Follow me. Verse 19, verse 22, we're going to pick this up next week. Follow me. To follow Jesus means bowing before him as the rightful Lord of all that you are and all that you have. It means uh, because of his grace and his forgiveness, we seek his will for the direction of our life and submit to that will even though we are not sure we we are of a, a heart disposition to follow him and if we yield to him it's because of his unmerited unconditional love of the gospel and we see his love and we seek his will and 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 daily we obey his word not to be saved but because we are the beloved and he loves you and he is sovereign over the universe even death then we're prepared what kind of death will you die? I don't know. Are you prepared? Do you see that Christ is the risen Lord? 
Will you show God to be enough in life? Will you show God to be enough in death? Will you show God to be enough to your soul? Will the loss of earthly things, family, friends, and all your possessions fade away when you seek and see and prepare for the incalculable worth of knowing Christ? You know you're growing as a Christian when the things of this world become less and less and the things of Christ become more and more. Let us pray. And Father, the, the, this, the, the way in which and the beauty in which you show forth your love to Peter, Father, is, is a, a, a deep water for our own souls. And Father, it, it is not about what we can do or have done. It's all about what Jesus has done and will do in our life. So, Father, we, we, we ask as we sing, as we respond to your word, that we would worship you in spirit and truth, that our hearts would be grateful and thankful for all that Christ has done. And maybe there's someone here that does not know you, that does not recognize and realize death is for all of us. Lord, you would change their heart. You would give them and grant them faith and repentance that they would now, as we sing, worship you, the risen Lord. And, Father, we pray that every day we'll become more and more and more in love with you. And Lord, we would allow your love to penetrate our hearts so that we are propelled on mission as Peter was. Even though death was imminent and, and, and sure, we will, we, will, we will press on. Press on the gospel. Press on our love for you, Father. Help us to worship you. Help us to respond right now, Spirit of God, in a way that brings you glory and us joy.